Cap rates are up in the United States, according to a recent survey from CBRE. Well, rents are also starting to their climb again with a positive month over month reading in February. So we've got a lot of new data sending around the multifamily industry and investors are wanting to know, is this the time to get into the market? Well, we're going to try to answer that question and many more today on The Gray Report. We've got great pieces from Marcus and Millichap, Apartment List, Newmark, CBRE, Capital Spectator, and the Federal Reserve, Bank of the United States. Maybe you've heard of them. All right, strap in. If, you're, if you are a multifamily investor, active, passive, some, if you, maybe you're in the industry, maybe you just are kind of interested in the whole space. Well, luckily for you, you're in the right spot. Every single week on The Gray Report, we are covering all of the latest research reports, data, throwing out some original opinions from the Gray Capital team. Strap in. This is going to be a great episode. Joined by Dr. Matt Bosnagel, the Director of Communications and Marketing here at Gray Capital. Let's get into it. Welcome back to the report. Dr. Matt Bosnagel joined joining us once again, producing the yeah. show, making all the marketing and great capital happen. Great research reports. Keeping them keeping it flowing. Keeping it, <laughs> keeping it fresh, keeping it flowing. We're in the beautiful Indianapolis uh, studios and headquarters mm-hmm. of Great Capital, Matt. Getting warmer. Nice. Spring is yeah. up, among us. Um, leasing season in the multifamily world. It's right on our doorstep. We're yep. seeing some some green shoots uh, pop up, not mm-hmm. just in the ground, but um, in terms of signed leases. When I get to the a lot of great data today, Matt, that you've put together, we're going to be getting into this apartment list report. Like we're here, just a second talking about where vacancy is, rent growth across the nation. What are some of the top markets to invest in? Look at what is what's occupancy look like. We're also going to be getting into cap rates. Um, so so much more. So again, I ask you this a lot, but you know, you've just spent the last you know forty eight hours or longer than that. But yep. you, the last couple of days, you're, you're putting mm-hmm. this report together synthesize you know your feeling of the multifamily market you know as it stands today and maybe any differences from last um week. you know I, I first the first thing that popped out on me is like i i always like a good cap rate forecast or a cap rate estimates because it's you know it's there's a lot to get from an in, from as inexact of a science as it you is you got to give them props for trying yeah, right yeah. you know because cap cap mm-hmm. rates you know uh you ask 10 people they're all over the board where yeah. cap rates are they're, it's a very opaque um data set to take try to mm-hmm. take a look at they're at, it's a survey it's not actual numbers it's just people's opinions yeah but for the most part it does seem like people expect some valuation increases over the next six months yeah um now that's th- th- that is a little bit fuzzy because I think that there was some natural optimism in at least the CBRE um, numbers. But the overall, it seems like people are are a little bit more, I'm sorry, probably significantly more optimistic about this, the commercial real estate market now than they were six months ago when it was previously measured by both Newmark and CBRE. So that's one of the takeaways. And the other one that I, um, that I was thinking about and that I kind of also noted in the newsletter was that uh, I think rent growth is starting to maybe pick up a little bit um we will see some seasonal some seasonal positive growth hopefully get to positive year-over-year growth at least by um by apartment lists measures um sometime in the summer but um it is a good trend and it is a really a really a sign that we're nearing the end of the correction i think that was caused by the massive you know once in history, uh, rent growth spike in 2021 and early 2022. Ever since like late 2022, there has been a cooling of rents. And so it's, it wasn't just 23. It was like the back end of 2022, all the way up to basically f- January, February of yeah. this year, there were it, there was slower rent growth than usual. And it, and it may continue this year. Um, what I was talking to you before beforehand was, and we were kind of hashing out like, well, yeah, rents went down, partly lots of uh, a major reason was supply. Um, but I think that it, that, that it needed two things. It needed supply and probably a correction um, just basically from the from the big highs, a little bit of a reversion of the mean yeah. of how, how that came about, if it was if it was motivated by, you know, the supply in reality or or if there's just like a magic rule that makes people reel back after they spent so much yeah but i asked matt i said matt you know what do you think rent growth would be if we we didn't have all this new supply coming on yeah. if we were kind of at an average year of you know call it 
350, 400,000, you know, units that yeah. range of yeah. you know, go back pre-pandemic you know, number of units delivered you know would we see negative rent growth and i think the answer is probably not yeah. i mean we saw yeah. really strong demand even the third quarter or fourth quarter of 23 mm-hmm. um I, I think though that you're right though that i think that there would have been some sort of correction of you know we just got over our skis back in 21 the first half of 22 on yeah. rent growth so we needed to, to dial that back down a little bit even today matt and, and look into this apartment list um piece right now um, you know, rents nationally are down about 1% year over year. Mm-hmm. They're positive for the month of February, yeah. which is the first time they've been positive nationally in a while. Yeah, six months, yeah. But still negative 1% year over year, but we're still up nominally $200 per month mm-hmm. compared to two years, you know, from looking two years yeah, that's prior. A, oh, very good point. So, yeah. you know, there's a, there's a different reality, whether you're a renter or looking at renting an apartment, mm-hmm. that you still rent seems to be a couple hundred dollars a month more than it used to be yeah. versus the uh, apartment owner. That, that's kind of what I was getting at with yeah. like the correction is like maybe the, we did reach a ceiling wherein, wherein people was like, I just can't spend any more. In fact, actually, I, I, I got to spend a little less this time. When if you look at, you know, I, I interviewed uh, Paul Fiorella, director of research at, over at Yardy Matrix uh, mm-hmm. this week, should be posted probably around now, um, should be coming out on the Great Capital YouTube channel. But um, we were going over their latest research mm-hmm. and the country right now, again, nationally, not every market, every market's different, but nationally, you know, rent, if you look at that, those rent to income ratios, mm-hmm. and I know there's a difference between Yardy's and some other sources yeah. that you'll probably push back on, but according to Yardy's, uh, what they're tracking we're basically maxed out on affordability at like nine, twenty nine point eight percent on mm. a national level. Mm-hmm. Um, again, you know, the Midwestern markets are a little bit more affordable. You know, San Francisco is like forty percent. Yeah. Um, but at at average, we're kind of there's not more there's not much more to squeeze. Okay. More, okay. More juice to squeeze. Yeah. Um, that's so where we're at right now. That's where we're at okay. right now okay. as a nation. And mm-hmm. so the idea is that it's there would need to be some sort of correction to bring that affordability in line of what people can spend. Mm-hmm. Although there's a lot of evidence that people will spend more than that. If you look at the coastal markets and expensive markets, people clearly are. And there's yeah. room to grow in the Midwestern markets like Kansas City, Indianapolis. Um but no, to your point is, you know, there probably was some correction yeah. that's coming due. Um, and um, but it looks like that there's enough demand right now that even though with all the supply that is coming online, it's going to be a subdued, mm-hmm. subdued year, 2024. Um, um, but I think it'll it, there's a chance that I think the growth could surprise us. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's going to shock us, but I think we could get a little bit of an upside, upside surprise. But we'll see another um, another potential headwind that was discussed yeah. a little bit last year is the um is the cessation or the, we don't people got to play their student loans again um mm-hmm. and i know that was talked about last year but it's really like but because of the way that these loans come in and they're pretty they, they get started like an old car kind of <laughs> yeah and so and so right now there are still lo- there are still student loans that are still kicking on again where people mm-hmm. have now after I mean, two, three, four years. Now they have to pay again, and I don't know what percentage of that is is people's income. Um, I know, you know. It- Hopefully, you know. I, I was talking to uh, Jay, Jay about this a couple mm-hmm. weeks ago, and you know, hopefully, those people who took out the student loans have had have jobs, and yep. wages have been increasing, and hopefully, mm-hmm. they're making more money, and hopefully, they're in a position that. You know, they at least can make afford the the payments. Um, they're not like underwater, but. Maybe not. I don't believe that anyone was like escrowing the funds. Yeah, yeah. The so one. I don't one know, is nightmare, this a, is this a, like, here's a nightmare situation. Is this personal. You have <laughs> here's what months? happened. Here's yeah, what okay. happened to me. Uh, I made. I I didn't pay. Yeah. I made more money, and now my income based repayment is is more than it was before. So that, you know, like after- Do you re- reduce your salary? Yeah, that's one. <laughs> that's right. Uh, but yeah, like, uh, and and I, it's not that like, we're not underwater by any means or anything like that, but it is, but it's think of that another though. thing you have to pay. Yeah, you, I, wasn't, payment. I wasn't thinking about that all those four yeah, years. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think anyone really was, you know, let's be honest with ourselves. No one was squirreling that money away and like- it, I'm sure some responsible person yeah. was somewhere. But the, <laughs> but the average, idiot like me isn't really thinking about it. It's, it's a bonus. It's nice. But I just wonder how much that burden's going to, because for me, they just, they just kick back in. Like I, oh, you really know, this is, did. they were just, and, they're just give me the calls. Did, did, didn't uh, Biden February. just somehow uh, uh, 
he did make some a, more student loans that he announced like last week or two weeks ago. He did do some kind of for there. Like there was there, like some small forgiveness, you know, spread yeah, spread here and there. I don't think it was near. It wasn't as generous as one before. It's a little generous, but it, it, I still think that the activation of all these loan payments again is going to. Uh, it doesn't help. Some but it, it doesn't yeah. help with you know consumer spending, and, and mm-hmm. that might be where if that first shows up is consumer spending. I think we actually had some consumer mm-hmm. spending numbers that came out today. I think we haven't pulled up. I, I don't think they're super strong, yeah. Um, but they're also not super weak either. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, and I just wonder on the student because I I think it's a uh, it's definitely an important issue to track. And I I, I question whether how broad based it mm-hmm. is and, yep. and how large of a portion of the economy it affects and 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 for the individuals that it does affect. Is it how how material is it? It's like yeah. all right, you know. I, I guess you know. Are you like in your so life, and you know, are are you changing what you do and how you not spend money? Not necessarily, but the but you might not. The fact that th- those four years were was a big thing. You know, I had I had it. You had extra in. income. Yeah, I had plugged into everything, and now I, and now I've got to make lifestyle changes. You know, it's not. No, let's say whatever um but but that, yeah that four years is a big you know turning it off and turning it on and um and, one yeah, less okay. trip a month to olive garden that's right <laughs> yeah 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 uh but but again I, I i also think when you're talking about um the population it could be a good portion of renters because you know it's young people and and i oh my all right we're picking uh back up on the gray report um after just a quick little um fire drill fire alarm went off in our on our building all is good everyone's safe uh at least we think yeah. um okay man let's get back into it i want to jump into this apartment list piece we were kind of yeah. um, beating around the bush not really but a little bit um the rent report for march but this is covering uh february data yeah um i label it as february rent yeah, report because it's yeah, a report about february exactly um, I, I think a couple headlines, and, and this is going to be a part of a narrative of seeing and observing a trend mm-hmm. emerge or identifying yep. this trend, which I think is really positive for the rest of the year. It's, it's not going to be a banger year, mm-hmm. but I think, again, it's this path to stability, normalcy, and growth um, and not utter uh, despair. So, yep. um, so, again, just big picture um, you know, looking at United States median rent from 2017 to present, mm-hmm. and we see this big run up that we all know about that started really in the beginning of 2021, and then the decline started happening at the second half of 22. We're, we're, we're seeing a little bit of lift here in February, which, you know, you would expect to see. Um, you know, we saw a little bit of a lift last year in 2023, also seasonally, you know, mm-hmm. one would expect. Um, but it's uh, the first time we've seen actually kind of month over month rent growth, I think six months, Matt. Yep. Um, so we see this is a um, looking at in every single month going back to 2019. I really like looking at this because you can see the seasonal patterns, yeah. which, and again, going back, they only have one year that's prior to the, to the pandemic, but you usually see, you know, the first half of the year, minus sometimes in, in January, we get a little bit of negative in January, and then it's growth throughout the spring and summer season mm-hmm. and slows down as we're getting into winter. You know, people are starting school and all that, and they're not looking for as many apartments. 2020 was just a crap year. No one knew what was going on, um, but then everyone caught up and realized there was a lot to me for apartments and we didn't have enough apartments and everyone was staying put and wanted more space mm-hmm. and weren't leaving their apartments. And so whew, rent growth shot up and now we're seeing the big correction from that. Um, it was very subdued 2023 kind of net negative growth. But this little this little uh, new data point here in, in February, Matt, is not a bad sign. And also the declines in January, this January, it was definitely negative, but not as steep as in 2023. Yep. Um, it's holding fairly true to previous patterns, um, or, or at least the idea that. Um, so as as we looked at the month over month, there's a big spike in 2021, and then there is a, and then it just kind of starts rippling after that. Right now, we're still a little bit in the ripple effect where we're correcting after that big spike in 2021, but uh, but the lows are not as low as they were. Um, 
I think things will be tamped down, but much more closer to normal than 2023 was. Yeah. And again, it, on that point, Matt, of just the lows weren't as low as, as previous lows in at the end, latter half of 23. The lows weren't as bad as some of the lows. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. As some of the lows at the end of 2022, the highs were higher yeah. at the first half of 2022, given mm-hmm. that whole year a positive average uh, rent growth. Um, but the highs were just not present in 2023. But the lows started to subdue a little bit. And again, this is the year. This was the year in 2023 when all the supply really started. Yeah. Um, so again, the mo- the biggest driver of this is the supply coming online. But as we mentioned just previously, there's also a little bit of you know correction going on from the peaks yeah. that took place in 21 and 22. And that's what and that's one thing that I that I learned new really um an apartment list pointed this out in their own report is that this past winter was not the worst time period for for multifamily in the past four years it was actually the winter of 2022 yeah. and when when we were in in that it wasn't it didn't feel so bad because the previous six months had been so good yeah well and um in the winter 2022 people were starting to be uh nervous because uncertainty yeah. in the economy rising interest rates mm-hmm. um we actually saw kind of a um demand that was higher than the 20-year average in the q4 of 23 yeah so really good demand a lot of supply so the net the net net was still negative rent growth um, because there wasn't enough absorption to keep up with supply, but the demand actually was really solid, yeah. um, giving us pretty uh, good amount of optimism. The optimism that once this supply does is absorbed, yeah, that's actually decent prospects. N- not worth ignoring is you know, oh yeah, the demand is absorbed by the supply, blah, 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 but but it is a measure of people wanting apartments, and as a forward indicator, it's pretty good if it, you know if it will continue. Yeah. Um, just looking at vacancy, we're basically back to you know pre-pandemic levels, more or less. Um, we're at six point six um, percent vacancy. We're six point eight back in July of twenty twenty, and we were right around a similar point um, prior to that. So yeah, um, that- a little elevated compared to the pre-pandemic average. I do think that this is the this is the balance of demand on the other side. Well- yeah, and it wouldn't be surprising if we were at eight percent vacancy with the supply. Yeah, yeah. The only way that we're at kind of this historical average is because we there, we are seeing a lot of demand for apartments. Mm-hmm. Houses are too expensive to buy. More people can't afford mortgages. So you know, people are, yeah. are renting apartments. That's want, what, what did I say? I was like, we have more apartments that are existing now than they existed more. We just need more people, more renters to exist yeah. too. Well, and, those, and that will come. Yeah, and there's but, still a lot of people. Yeah. It's just there's a mismatch of what's being delivered yeah. and different price points. Um, um, so Matt, this was interesting. We talked about this a lot, looking at their rent growth numbers, comparing to CPI, total inflation, the top line inflation, and then also breaking out um, rent of primary residents, that component of CPI. Um, talking about you know really highlighting the lags between the two metrics, um, and and then highlighting um, and underlining as we have in the past, you know we being able to you see the current rent growth, market rent growth, as a major leading indicator. That will show up in the rent of primary residence as a you know, component of total CPI. So in a way, we can kind of sort of predict the direction of rent of primary residence, not exactly when the drops will happen yeah. um, because there's a, such a huge delay. I mean, you see how quickly rents came down on the apartment list. Um, and, and while they were coming down more than a year, yeah, more than a year while, you know, rents were coming down, according to CPI, they, they still were continuing to rise. Well, it's, long, it's like a 16 month gap. It's so, it's so yeah. Long. And we thought and, and we tracked this so close. We were uh, really I was expecting it around 12 months and maybe 13. We kept being like, the wait, previous 12 months. Data, there were studies. OK, 18 months. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe 20. No, it's 24. Are we? Yeah. It's a 24 months is what it, more it looks like. So um, it's it's really interesting. Um, I'm glad they included that. Yeah. Um, because we're certainly tracking that as well. We, we talked about occupancy. Um, you can see a little bit, you know, I mean, a little bit of pickup here, Matt, in this mm-hmm. in this crazy multicolored chart that Apartment List puts out. Um, the the darker red, I guess, more the more bold colors is kind of, uh, well, I guess, dark blue is. It's hot and cold. Hot and cold. Blue is each hot, square is a, represents a month of rent growth. You know, in, in a in, in a particular market. Yes, exactly. We're looking at hundred largest U.S. cities. So in twenty twenty one, we see a lot of these red squares. Yeah, because a lot, a lot of was, heat. Yeah. And then it uh, <laughs> and then it then it cool. Then it, it was pretty warm. It was pretty still warm. And, yeah. But but look how. Um, you know, there's a lot of con- see. There's yeah. a lot of condensation here, Matt. Oh yeah, the red yep, and the blue. Yep. 
Um, that's that's where a lot of condensation and turbulence. That's the storm front. That's the storm front, right? <laughs> There's the low pressure system coming in. That's where you can see tornadoes. Um, and then it was just kind of like misty, cloudy, 2023. Just it was just fog and gray. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, it was like the Midwestern winter that we've all experienced. Just gray and and, and that was actually notable. 2022 <laughs> highs and lows. 23, yeah, stagnant. I think that's Indianapolis right there. Uh, I hope so. I don't know. It's a, um, a lone but, uh, spot of growth. 2024. It's um, it looks just like gray. So we don't. They don't. Yeah. Know. We don't know. Although we just gave you our sort of expectations. And then, you know, looking at some of the uh, markets, um, 57 of the largest 100 cities have negative year over year rent growth. What are some of the, you, know, you can see there's a major concentration down here in the southern U.S., so much rent growth that already took place. Yeah, the west and the south. Um, sure. Looks like the, the Midwest and the Northeast are still seeing pockets of growth mm -hmm. with a couple exceptions. Um, but it's, it's just really interesting to see these regional dynamics play and it's out. Fairly clear, too, to. You can paint a broad brush when it comes to this because you're going to cover if you just paint along the south side of America, uh, you know, the southern you know, the southern portion of America, that's where the rent is going down. Well, and that's what investors did, Matt, yeah. largely, is they were like, well, you know, we, you know, thinking you're being data dependent, being like, you know, we're, we're tracking migration trends. And so we're investing in the Sun Belt because that's where the migration patterns are. Yeah, true. But, you know, you and every other investor and their yep. uncle and then every other international investor all had the same idea. Um, and so, you know, it, we over, they over, people overpaid, mm -hmm. over invested yep. and got ahead of their skis. These are going to be great markets to invest in, you know, now and in the next couple of years, because I think you'll be able to pick up some yeah, yeah. Good prices and there will be growth. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it goes to show there, there's nuance and everything and even in multifamily investing. And I told uh, you, you that, can't look at just one know, metric. This was last, I think it was maybe last year in one of our multifamily, uh, multifamily meetups, we had a, uh, I was talking to someone that, that was really keen on Phoenix and, you know, Phoenix is not doing well when it comes to rent growth. It's near the bottom over for slowest metro level rent growth at negative 4% over the last 12 months. But, um, but yeah, there's an argument to be made. That's it. That city's going to grow again and, oh, and people are going to yeah. come back and, and it was, it, it's hard to bet against it. And we, and you may be seeing a, a market bottom that, uh, that people can take advantage of. Yeah. The price has to be right, and it can be good. You can be yeah. growing, but you can pay too much for growth. Yeah. Um, fastest metro level rent growth, looking at past three years, past twelve months, the past six months. Again, we're seeing um, a lot of um, midwestern markets take some top spots. Um, recently, Milwaukee over the last six months, number one growth. Past twelve months is Grand Rapids. Um, over the past three years has been my is Miami, which not a surprise there, mm -hmm. but Grand Rapids coming at number two, then Tampa, then New York, Tucson. Those aren't those aren't shockingly mm -hmm. surprising, you know, and then the bottom two of the, the top 10 are Chicago and Indy. This chart is or, or this yeah chart here shows a list of markets that are, are kind of surprising because if you had seen this list. Um, even a year ago, I don't think that those Midwest or Northeast markets would be in there. Well, other than like my, other than Miami, honestly, if you, if you would have if you showed like an average investor in these lists and you didn't include the fastest or slowest, you said and you took out the percentages and said, you know, is this the slowest or the fastest um, yeah. you know, yeah. growing metros? Um, you would have a lot of people who would give you the wrong answer. Yeah, because the list would be Austin, um, Phoenix. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to Charlotte, look at Charlotte, yeah, Orlando, yeah. Atlanta. Now Tampa showed up and showed up in the strong list. Tampa and Miami. You got to put those in there. But yeah, all a, a lot of these people would be Sun confused. Because again, you know, San Francisco. You know, before the pandemic was like the poster child for crazy rent growth. Yeah, yeah. I almost rents. said San Francisco. I was like, nope, nope, <laughs> not the past four but, years. But I'm saying, if you would have asked some, you could maybe not today. If mm -hmm. You're a sophisticated, you know, market multifamily market watcher, but you know, go back two or three years ago and showed people these lists, they yeah. would think you were absolutely uh, nuts. Um, but you know, the data is the data, and we thank um, all the folks at um, uh, Apartment List for all the great work yeah, that they real. do. We really appreciate it. It's really good stuff. Okay, Matt, um, where are we gonna we're gonna go from here now to the uh, oh cap rates. We're gonna look at more multifamily oh, yeah. data. Um, because you know, okay, so cap rates, capitalization rates, it, it's it's the formula that we use to evaluate um, uh, commercial real estate. You know, we take it, the net operating income, um, and then you divide that by your cap rate, and that can give you the value of the asset. Then you can do the opposite. You can take kind of the the value. You can take the 
net operating income divided by the value, and that'll give you your cap rate as well. Um, and so, but it's the one metric that folks use to actually, um, again, value these assets. And it has been the cause of much speculation over the last 18 months because the price has been a question. The values have been a major question as yep. the interest rates have risen. You can't pencil deal deals or returns are low. And as the risk-free rate, which is, you know, treasury yields increases, investors are going to demand a higher return and yield, which is often translated or viewed as the cap rate, which that's not necessarily true, but it's the closest sort of thing that people use. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's fine. And so we got to see where they are. No one knows. So, so these cap rate surveys that we're going to go over to from one one from Newmark here in a second, and and even even the surveys, even if they were taking now, some of these surveys, it's almost like looking at a star. You're looking at something that existed millions of years ago. <laughs> There's a little bit of the, the, the information that we can is is necessarily in the past. So we'll never yeah. get up to date things. Like if you were to negotiate today, it wouldn't it wouldn't maybe fit what people were thinking um, when they took this, which was like the end of. 2023. Yeah, no, that, that's a really good point. And, and, and it requires a little bit of an explanation beca yep. because we've mentioned this multiple times, but you know, the time it takes between the offer on a property mm -hmm. and the closing, and then the reporting of that cap rate can easily be six months. Yep. Um, and so all of this data is lagging. And then all of this isn't actually, you know, hard data. This is a survey yep. of opinions. And so lagging opinions mm -hmm. in an, an environment where there's not a lot of price discovery, people are just kind of thinking to the last deal that they saw or where they think that cap rates should be or where they think deals should trade at. Um, Matt, do you know who the, the, the breakdown of who was interviewed um, in no, let's, who let's this go survey? Because I'm pretty know, sure that it was a CBRE limited survey. To see via CBRE brokers, yeah, because uh, if there was a lot of estimates here, then you would see um, in their um, in their chart that they have CBRE econo ec econometric advisors is the source. Yeah, there is a chart on page four, I think, mm -hmm. and where so each one of those. Oh, I actually like this one. Yeah, I was a little bit confused on it, and I was hoping you could lead me, oh. much like you led me through the storm fronts of the uh, no, uh, apartment. No, I was list I chart. was confused on this one as well, Matt, because I don't know what the um, I guess the x axis. I don't know what the axis. So axis each is. Of, I know they're both cap rates. Each but, of um, these each of these squares represents two cap rate estimates. And um, so, like the first estimate is uh, the first estimate in um, 2023 was a little over four, and then in uh, that's in H1 2023, and then the second H2 2023 that was also a little above four, and and I believe uh, we're so. The difference between yeah, H1 so and H2. I believe that each one of these squares is one of the guys that work at at CBRE or at least one survey respondent. My my general point is though, it's not a it's not the 900 people. I don't think there's 900 squares on this. It's it's a relatively well, limited. So this is the whole sp survey. spread of, you know, I guess in their universe of transactions that took place or transactions they were aware of or theoretical transactions that should have taken place yeah. in cap rates and mm -hmm. what that spread and difference between the first half of last year and the second half. And I was surprised um, because I guess not shocked, but you know, just the amount of deals that were still done um, in the multifamily space um, that was under a five cap. Um, that not there, there yeah. were plenty. There were some that were done at an eight cap, but it was certainly the minority. The, the majority, you know, really were kind of done, kind of between like a, a um, kind of a five and you know, just below, kind of mid fives, low fives to sit, low fives to six. Mm -hmm. I mean, a decent amount being done in the six percent cap rate range. Um, but still definitely slightly lower. And then when you look at office, um, you know, obviously significantly higher in a much wider, um, spread, some extreme yeah. spreads, um, but multifamily still in a relatively tight pocket. But again, we had, you know, um, transaction volumes were down 60 to 70% in 2023. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the big story is, um, you know, we just didn't, we haven't had a lot of price discovery and, okay. Okay. um, you know, some of these, in the deals that were done, a lot of them are loan assumptions, and so you can pay mm -hmm. a little bit lower over cap rate, or, or you, you you can. You not always a good idea because you still your basis matters. Um, but really interesting to see this this breakdown. 
Um, yeah. I liked so this is one that I could <laughs> I could really grasp a little bit. I had to yeah. work my I had to figure that out on the fly just now. The other the other graph, but this yeah. graph represents. And here's where I would kind of agree with you. It's like not an absolute indicator of where cap rates would have trended. I'm not going to say that their predictions get it wrong or right, but what I'm really interested in is how these predictions changed. And for and across the board for all of these, um, there are there are fewer people that think that cap rates are going to rise. Um, now, my big caveat is even even those estimates like they, it seems like their default is a pretty much optimism, and they think that cap rates will compress. Uh, Matt, correct me if I'm wrong. But yep. we covered a piece from CBRE last year. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Um, at the latter half of the year, and it basically said that cap rates were done rising. Oh yeah, you remember you know that? What? Piece? I do remember that. I don't see them mentioning that. Yeah, well, they basically well, maybe... they, they basically called you know basically in the second half of twenty three last year yeah. that cap rates had peaked. Yeah, yeah. I okay, okay. No, that that's a good point. That definitely was. That, that definitely yeah um, we'll, we'll find that article well, so, we'll, okay, we'll so okay so at in at, in h h1 2023 which is the darker bars here mm -hmm. they have 70 percent of of respondents in the cbre survey think that cap rates would increase set uh 50 think retail uh a scant 35 think uh think that multifamily in, uh cap rates will increase and then industrial is about half and hotel um but for all of these they went down 20 percent so 20% less people. So you're saying, though, that the majority of multifamily investors all throughout 2023 thought that cap rates would not increase. They would come down. Yes. I, that's what the, the, That was the most surprising thing for me was the fact that the, their baseline – I was trying to convey that. The, their baseline is like pretty optimistic about asset values rising last year. It's it's just like having a conversation with some bro – sometimes some brokers <laughs> and you yeah, hear what yeah, they say, yeah. or some, some other people in the multifamily industry who when they say things I'm like, what world are you living in? So you have to – but but if you know what world that, that you're living in and you if, can track yeah. the change, then you may be able to get somewhere. So You can infer – yeah, you can yeah, infer yeah. – so, so, yeah, no. And so the change true. is – is at least for all for all of these, some more than others, uh, everyone's getting more optimistic about asset values increasing. Whether they were optimistic to begin with, whatever, but um, things are getting more promising if you're looking yeah. for your property values to increase. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can download this. Um, you know, if you get, especially if you're a subscriber to the Gray Report newsletter, um, kind of breaks down a lot of different markets. Although, um, you know, Matt. Mm -hmm. And I don't know when I when I see the the list of the Midwestern yep, markets yep. and they don't have Indianapolis. Um, yeah, I, I get it. You can't have every market, but I'm like, oh, you got Omaha on there. It's like when you look for well, you back Omaha. in the day, you looking got... at your snow day, and they you see the school that's after yours. Oh yeah, exactly. Oh, it's just it, it's it's especially you after you know adding um, you know uh, some new members to the CBR, Indianapolis CBRE team. I thought in India, I thought that they, that might be a feature, but. We have some lobbying power. <laughs> we'll um, have to reach out for yep. comment. Okay, uh, so just just to follow up, and I'm more just curious, Matt, on the yep. differences because there's another piece that Newmark um, put out, um, also looking at cap rates. Matt, was, yep. is there a big difference here? And that's all I really want to know. So, um, I if if you want to scroll down to their multifamily numbers, I have that pulled up here just specifically on page 21. So they have the West, Central, East, and then even below that is their United States numbers. So I really was only looking at the uh, the difference in their, um, so there is the change from the first quarter 23, and then the change from first quarter 22, and then the change from mid 23. So what really it's the one, um, it's the one right to the left of the cap rates. It is this how, like how did how much did cap rates change? Um, and and it's it is about it's fairly similar, um, at least for uh, for the West. It's about twenty seven basis points. Actually, it seems a little bit stronger of an increase than the expectations of a change in CBRE. Now that's not a one to one thing, um, but they have a little more granular data in this new mark. So it was it, instead of a uh, instead of a scatter plot of all of these different estimates like they had in CBRE, they'll give the average number. Which for the United States as a whole, the average cap rate is expected for what is it so class a is 5.42 percent class b uh, this is for the central business district is 5.96 and then for, for suburban class a it's 5.58 percent cap rate and suburban class b is 6.05 cap rate i think that those seem a little bit 
seem, seem pre- fairly accurate. Um, yeah, I would say, uh, yeah, I, I think so. I think that sounds about right. It's pretty close. But, you know, every market's going to be really different. So you're yeah. looking at an average of some really different markets. Um, you know, I, I still see deals coming out closer to five caps and low five caps for newer product for class a so here's something worth noting here i was i was trying to interpret this chart here they they represent the change in the cap rates yeah. since the last um since the last measurement almost all of these changes are positive changes so an increase of 15 basis points except for uh cbd class b in, in the, the east, east. Yeah. that had that had two basis points of uh of negative yeah, but it's basically just right around six it was already a little bit elevated it looks like yeah but uh, basically, you know, they're, they are recording continued cap rate expansion here. Um, I, I don't think that this is a recording of expectations like the CBRE one was. True. So it's slightly different. It is more of a snapshot of how things really, if we're talking using the stars metaphor, this is how things looked months and months ago. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and doesn't probably. necessarily uh, necessarily represent a uh, with the current state of the market another notable thing here is too if you're especially if you're looking at the united states as a whole the cap rate change in the previous period was around 55 and na- and then in the in and then in the, the most recent period, the cap rate change was around 25. So that cap, the rate of cap rate expansion, as measured by Newmark, is is slowing down. Yeah, um, so that's a good point. So maybe there is some credence to the uh, CBRE piece yeah. as well. Um, all right, Matt, there's a piece uh, video um, John Chang from Marks and Miller Chat put out. Do you want? Do you want to? Are we want to watch the? Yeah, we can cover it here. You can put it in the background. Or I've got some notes on it. Um, I I do. Th- I'm glad that you that we kept. Ex- kept this it's it's a little bit of a subplot that's been going on in the CRE market and I think we do need a, a reminder yeah you know um, the a lot of the headlines for this piece were on um, kind of foreclosures mm-hmm. in the multifamily space and there's a tick up in um, delinquency and foreclosures um, you know realistically you know the delinquency rate that is increased has increased from like you know, 0.3% to 0.5%. Yeah, and so then they're like, blown up over that so relative it's, So increase. it's like, it's like yeah. it's up 60%. It's like, yeah, yeah. but it's on, still under a percent. Yeah. But it is increasing, mm-hmm. um, and there are more foreclosures today than there were. Um, not that there are a ton of foreclosures, but there are definitely four, you know, way more foreclosures happening than there have been in the past. Mm-hmm. But a lot of this, Matt, is, is kind of central around this idea of, you know, all the loans um, that um, – have matured or were yeah. supposed to mature mm-hmm. and getting into, you know, kind of what happened to a lot of those loans that were sp- supposed to mature because it looks like a big chunk of them got the can was kicked down the road yeah. as was kind of expected as we've been kind of calling out. Mm-hmm. Um, as you see here, you know, in the video foreclosures have, have you know, creeped up. I'm still kind of historically not too crazy, mm-hmm. but, um, and so, you know, what's going to happen to you? Because there's basically, basically tag, they tagged on an additional like $250 billion of loans that are expected to mature in 2024. Mm-hmm. The idea is that those aren't new loans, that those were, you know, extended loans that were supposed to yeah. expire yeah. in 2023. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, they only have so much time now for to work those out for yeah. rates to come down, which maybe they would, maybe they will, yeah. maybe they won't. So. I wonder what the typical term of an extension is. If it's a year, if it's two years, I uh, you know I'm not as familiar with that. But. And they're all probably a little bit different. Mm-hmm. You know, there's probably some that they were giving you an extra year and, and maybe an additional extension after that. But they all aren't. They're not going to be free extensions. You're typically going to have to, you know, come up with some money. Yeah. You know, some sort of deposit or more money in the deal, some mm-hmm. skin in the game. Um, you know, it's not going to be free. Yeah. So. What what he did say is that somewhere between 300 and 500 billion of last year's maturity debt was likely deferred. So it's just okay, likely it's a little bit of a fuzzy yeah. uh, a fuzzy number, but that is still a lot. And if if 270 of this debt matures this year, that ups the total of maturities from around 650 billion to around 900 billion, which is like a notable chunk added to the total. Yeah. So the deferments are, and I don't know. You know what the usual what the usual amount is. Obviously, there's probably every year there's probably billions of dollars of deferred debt, but I'm yeah. I'm sure that this is a lot more than yeah. than the past. A- a- absolutely, and so I think the question is, you know, we've been able to, um, you know, es- avoid um, extreme pain. Um, at least for now, in the multifamily industry, a lot of borrowers, a lot of owners have been able to, you know, survive. And again, mm-hmm. that idea of, you know, surviving until 25, 
Um, you know, here's talking about this $270 billion of, yeah. you know, loans that have basically been tacked on in 2024. Um, you know, how long can we survive and um, will interest rates come down and valuations yeah. um, come up? Now, you can see if you're a, if you're a borrower, mm -hmm. if you're an owner and your interest rate's gone up, you've got a loan that's maturing. And if you're a lender who really doesn't want to take the property back, they'd rather it all work out. Mm -hmm. And that's what everybody wants. Um you can you can tell a story um, and paint a narrative that isn't mm -hmm. too unrealistic that um, creates a path to success yeah. of yeah. saying, "Hey, look, everyone's telling me, including all the banks, and you know, even talking to the lender, you, you, your econo economists are saying that interest rates are going to come down by the end of this year." Yeah, you know, last month you said that there were going to be six rate uh, rate, rate um, decreases. Now it's not going to be six. Wait, can we pause it just right here? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so Go this represents here. the amount of debt by each property type. Um, and the, the, finish your thought. Sorry. Oh um, no no no! It, 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 it's just like the these terms of extension. Uh, I I'm I'm really curious because the way that you know, and we we talked about how there was a wave of maturities, but even then we were we were outlining several possibilities. We weren't really, you know, saying that it's certain doom, but we were going to say that, you know, we said that the market was affected in our coverage of loan maturities last well, year. Well, they, we said that the lender most likely they would extend them as long as mm -hmm. they could until yeah, they, yeah. they couldn't. And that's the question is, you know, again, there's still there's still a very clear there's a path. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe it's not very clear, but there is a path to. Being able to square all of these loans if interest rates come down mm -hmm. and valuations come back up, and yeah. if people can bring the necessary money to cover any shortfalls, that's the other thing. There is rescue capital that's out there, mm -hmm. and really, in some scenarios that aren't that great, it's the banks aren't necessarily losing money; it's just the equity holders are getting wiped out, and that's not good for the investors and the owners and the equity holders. Yeah. But it, it's not uh, seeping into the broader. Um, you know, financial or the banking system, I guess. I would argue not even not even the broader, fi not even the broader like multifamily market or True. any in individual sector, because not last in year, not in a systemic way. Yeah. It's much more like individuals. Yeah. Like yeah. Groups are dealing with mm -hmm. issues and foreclosures. And, and I mean, I mean, I know it, I know personally yeah. more the people who have lost all mm -hmm. of their capital and investments recently. And and it, what what is kind of interesting and maybe this is, you know, this kind of harkens back to fear versus greed. Yeah. But uh the way that our multifamily report was kind of received largely was like people were interested in opportunities to buy. It wasn't necessarily yeah. they, and and I could be completely wrong this maybe could be colored by on my own bias, but I think it was much rather oh here's uh there's going to be a buying opportunity rather than oh man, I got to protect this is coming for me next. I mean, that's certainly the way you know we, we had been looking at it yeah um but i i think it's i i think it's Im important uh to understand kind of whichever angle you're looking at yeah. it from a just this is going to impact the the market and valuations are going to come down mm -hmm. whether i want to buy or i'm just concerned about my own properties currently yeah. um but then also you know again how does it affect uh the lenders and the banks that have issued these loans if they can't be paid back if the banks yeah. have to take them over there, there's a lot of you know second and third um you know layer you know p potential effects um yeah. Yeah. but so but right now it's been much more um the distress has been in, in, in and this is was laid out in a report it's been very pocketed and mm -hmm. relatively isolated you know there's been isolated yeah. banks that have had issues there have mm -hmm. been isolated deals there have been isolated operators but it's, um, you know, maybe, you know, there are certain markets where there are concentrations. Uh, Houston may be one of them. Yep. Um, Austin, uh, Phoenix would all be markets where, you know, are uh, you're going to see some more, you know, just not, again, not systemic, but just market dynamics that yep. are um, market dynamics that had led to a lot of over speculation and over building yep. and over investment um and now that downswing you know, has a lot more potential for mm. loss and pain yeah good point um but that's not every market that's just that's kind of a yeah a, a small handful of the high fly markets mm -hmm. that we were uh, that you know we, we track yeah in the united um, united states and, and i wanted to note this before before the video shifts away from this chart here uh they have the relative amount of well they did um of we can go back. of deferment compared to the amount of debt that's maturing uh that's expected to mature in 2024 and uh, uh and what's interesting is multifamily only 
um, only had two billion of its of the debt that's maturing in 2024. Only two billion of their 257 billion total is expected to to is is deferred from the previous year. Hmm. They also have this chart here uh, where it shows CRE debt maturing in 2024 by property type, and they also break it down by the amount that is deferred from previous years that is maturing this this year. Um, now, in in office, there's a, a big chunk. 89 billion is deferred compared to the 206 billion that is maturing in 2024. Industrial, similar, 48 can over. You know, that's almost half of their of their 110 billion total maturities. In hotel, uh, same story. 45 billion deferred out of 150 or out of 105 billion total. Retail, a little sliver. 8 billion compared to 71 billion total. Now the smallest sliver both in absolute terms and relative to its total, is multifamily. Only $2 billion of CRE debt mature, was deferred from the previous year that's maturing this year compared to $257 billion that is simply just maturing. I, uh, I was very surprised at that number, how such a small, especially considering there was a, this wave of, of loan maturities that happened in October and, and November, that there was a conversation that was had there and something happened. And I don't, you know, maybe they all paid it. So what, what's the difference between the, this chart and the, this last chart? What's, what's this? Why is it? This why is, is it, the total is it? For, for all of the markets. So for all sectors, it is $270 billion total that is deferred and, and set to mature. Oh, this is all CRE, not just multifamily. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Got it. Makes sense. Um, Going to have to follow follow up on this. I'm really going to start tracking uh, tracking the Mortgage Bankers Association because they put out this data, and um, I kind of want to dig into it and see and see some of the reasons why multifamily had such a small sliver of loans that were deferred. Yeah, that that's really that's really interesting. Maybe they didn't need to. Maybe they all paid. Maybe they all paid. <laughs> I, I, I kind of looking at it, they are inferring based on change based on changes in the the amount of loans that that mature in 24 at different points uh i think it is is a little bit of an imperfect measurement but uh i think it is surprising and it could be a reflection of maybe uh, like origination changes or or something that happened it's a little bit there's something missing yeah. here and i'll and i'll definitely yeah i'm curious that, that, that multifamily deferment that yeah. see that seems low but you know the the, the data is there until we have other data yeah, yeah. okay matt I want to just pivot quickly, quickly, just talk about some macro stuff. And I want to keep this relatively brief um, because we talk about it a lot, yep. but just putting a lot of different data points together, I think it does yep. give some positive signs for some of these lenders and yep. borrowers yep. that, um, you know, we, there may be some line at the tunnel and there's some reason for some hope. I wouldn't be overly optimistic and, you know, mm -hmm. assume everything's going to be just fine, but some positive news on the inflation front which leads to potential um, interest rate decreases at mm -hmm. some point in the future. Um, just by looking at some of the comments that the Federal Reserve Bank has made in their monetary policy report, but then also some new data that's come out, um, whether that's the jobs report, uh, the private market studies that came out today, the official reports coming out tomorrow, some of the um, consumer um, credit, consumer spending reports uh, that, that, that just came out, PCE and CPI that just came out. And it's all um, lining up with what Jerome Powell has been saying of, you know, we don't necessarily need to see a major improvement in the economic data. But we just need to see a continuance yeah. of this data that's kind of moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, and that is that that's really what we're seeing right now is yep. kind of a continuing of some good data that when I say good, it means it's not showing a resurgence of inflation, moderation, mm -hmm. moderate growth, some declining growth. And, um, and the big thing to me that I saw recently is some of the expectations of GDP throughout the rest of the year, Matt, yeah. because I can't imagine if GDP is, you know, growth is going to be yeah. not bad, but it's not going to, it's, it's going to be slower. That's yeah. good for that. Those are the signs that fed are looking for to say, okay, we can cut rates and it's not going to send the economy into hyperinflation. Yeah. Even the, <coughs> excuse me, even these expectation, this article from the capital spectator that 
talks about U.S. U.S. growth slowing. Um, they that's what they say in the first quarter, but then it's almost like they spend half of the other half of the article talking about all these positive signs. Um, so yeah, GDP slower, but then they also say that uh, that. Th- private sector output increased in the fastest pace in eight months. And for the first time in two years, the business roundtable's quarterly gauge of CEO sentiment is above its historical average. So business leaders are thinking things. Stock are markets, you know, stock market. Yeah. I mean, okay. Stock markets up. Mm-hmm. Bitcoin just yeah. at a all time high again. Yeah. So, you know, the economy is, is doing well. And again, this mm-hmm. is this weird Goldilocks, yeah. you know, situation of where, you know, certain things are growing, but we're not everything. Not everything is in hyperdrive. It's relative yeah, Bitcoin, balances are sh- me, you know shaken up. Yeah, Bitcoin makes me a little bit. It's, it's a little more confusing or maybe confounding because I sometimes I interpret Bitcoin as like the escape hatch for people that are worried about the economy and, and a little bit like gold, how they run into that. Yeah, I think I, I, are, you know, the, I think what Bitcoin is meant it means is is. It's changed a lot over the last couple of years, yeah. and I don't think we finally settled on what you know the price of Bitcoin truly means. I, yeah. I, I think that it's more or less treated as a risk asset right now. There's mm-hmm. more correlation to Bitcoin and yeah, the stock point. market yeah. Yeah. now than really kind of anything, um, because in the last couple of years they've been somewhat correlated. Now, obviously, there's been driver. And not this wasn't intended to talk about Bitcoin, but you know, with the Bitcoin ETF that yeah. launched a couple yeah. months ago, that's yeah. obviously a that's big a driver. Point. There's a having coming up later in this year, mm-hmm. and every time there's been a having. The price of Bitcoin has, you know, exploded by X, X percent. So I think there's some there's some other reasons, but yeah. I think that um, again, stock market is you know full on acceleration mm-hmm. mode. Bitcoin. Um, my sense uh, from multifamily investors mm-hmm. is that it's risk on. Also, just the deals have to be good. Yeah. Um, just like people are buying stocks that they don't that are that aren't any good mm-hmm. or that aren't attractive. Um, people are buying some expensive stocks. Um, but there's definitely investors in the market trying to make some moves. I definitely think there's some caution. There's mm-hmm. some caution, especially around real estate still. Yep. Um, but uh, no, it, it's. It, I, I think when this business leaders are seeing positivity, it's because you know, just like we were seeing in some of the rental data, we're seeing a little bit of a tick up. Yeah. Um, maybe interest rates are coming down. The yep. stock market's up. That's all. That's all it, positive. I think it's a good good way to frame this lower GDP not as a not as a like sign of catastrophe, but just as a natural settling of the economy that hopefully could be a positive indicator for uh, for future interest rates. Yeah, I agree. Although you, we could go straight to the horse's mouth and just uh, and just review what the Fed itself thinks because they did release their monetary policy report and um, and I what thought fun, about not. I, I I love that the the design of, the, of this. What, yeah. what who what is this? Uh, this is like kind of avant garde. Yeah, uh, yeah. garde like uh, decision to have like these images that are like different sized. Like, yeah, what, what is this? Yeah. Desi- what is what is this design, Matt? That's a good point. Like, that is it's two not centers, pictures, two pictures of the same building, different angles in different seasons. This is snow. Like, why would you use this picture? Wow. Who makes? Uh, we're talking about it. It's art now. It's art. this is this is art. I I mean, if. You, at first, when you look at this, be like, "All right, this is." And I know we're not talking about the. It's a mild. It's a mild title. But again, but again, the, the Federal Reserve communicates in cryptic ways, Very true. and so you know you have to not only read between the lines. This is like uh, Taylor Swift lyrics, really. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's what we're doing here, Matt. Yeah. yeah. And I look at this design, and I don't know. Maybe we should cut this out. Maybe we should. No, no, no. But but when I look at this design, I'm like, okay, this is like you know 2002 yep i, I haven't agree. updated the template mm-hmm. i'm like what font is this we need yeah. to start using it <laughs> I, I like it that's good um but then i'm looking at this picture and i don't know what to say matt i it, it is it's uh it's kind of maybe it's just on the 90s trend of early like early photoshop but like yeah. again a little, little low low resolution it's like a low resolution shot of the Federal Reserve building with like this yeah, yeah, yeah. third bath Very, on the center uh, on the side. Composed, let's just say. Uh, in the winter, and then another. It, it, it's this is it's fascinating. Yeah. Um, and anyway, let's get into. Um, All right. So. Whatever. Uh, I wanted They're to include this because they this just is have a full blank. Like, what, what, yeah, that's the dust cover kind of thing, right? This is is that what that is <laughs> that what that is? Know. That's not the <laughs> dust cover. It's like Paige intentionally left blank. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is this 
monetary policy report is what the Fed thinks about the economy, or at least what they are, you know, telling us what they think about the economy. Uh, really, I, I think, you know, it's a good summary of what their mindset is. And um, I can give a good faith lightning round summary of the 71 page report right now. Okay. So um, they broke it down into several different sections. Um, and they have just a, a few comments on each really at the at the start. Um, but there are plenty of graphs and really detailed information throughout this. So and, and we could really spend a whole hour going into just one section. I'm going to cut to the summary here. People so, are looking at the timestamp on the, the current gray report. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're like, don't yeah. go for it. <laughs> uh, labor is relatively tight, which is good for employment. Demand exceeds supply of, of workers, even with increases in labor supply from border labor force participation and immigration. That's mm -hmm. what they said. Inflation, it's slowing and it's widespread across goods and services prices. Um, economic activity, real GDP increased 3.1% last year, notably faster than 2022. And, um, despite tight, tighter financial conditions, including elevated longer-term interest rates. Oh, elevated interest rates. I wonder where those came from. <laughs> Who did that? Uh, yeah. Financial conditions. Credit is available, but rates are high. What can you do? I mean, like, really, what can you do? That's my that's my thought. Is, is that the I'm saying that? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> that's me. I forgot that I put my own snark in here. Uh, financial stability. We are stable, but declines in the fair values of fixed rate assets have been sizable relative to the regulatory capital at some banks. Um, I just saw uh, another chart in, another, in something that you could find on the Gray Report newsletter. If you're subscribed at grayreportllc.com slash newsletter. Um, the small bank holdings of CRE debt has is just so much higher. Yeah, um, yeah. But they are saying that, um, yeah, declines have been have been sizable relatively to the regulatory capital at some banks. That kind of is a little is a little shaky. Um, and, and as for the balance sheet of the Fed itself, they're still reducing it, their holdings of Treasury securities. And this is the most relevant and I think really interesting um, part of their report here is they talk about the housing sector. And I think they're really bang on on their assessment in that mortgage rates went up. That reduced housing demand. But it, it also discouraged people from selling. So that supported additional single family home construction. On the yeah. other hand, on the multifamily side, high interest rates actually discouraged uh, multifamily construction. So you have the situation that we've talked about here a little bit where the same cause, which is high interest rates, uh, encourages single family, but discourages yeah. multifamily. Matt, I think it's interesting that um, on this, you know, on the housing rents piece, they don't even include <laughs> no, the CPI yeah, yeah. portion of, of you know rent of primary residence. So yeah. again, you know, we've asked this and, and we, we've kind of made some conclusions. Like you know, they, they they know they know. Yeah. Um, but it, it's just interesting that you know that much weight, if any, is given to CPI, like the top line CPI at all. If they're even saying like when we're looking at housing rents, we're not even going to look at that mm -hmm. the component of CPI. We're going to look at Zillow, CoreLogic, Single Family Detached, PCE Housing Services, and RealPage. PCE Housing Services seems pretty interesting. It still looks like it's a lagging indicator, but it looks far more responsive to market conditions. Yeah, than and PCE is going to be basically we'd rather look at this than the CPI because this is yeah. you know from the government and it mm -hmm. would be lagging also, but it's a little bit different metric than. Um, yeah. How CPI. Yeah, yeah, that is really interesting. And and it, it does go to show that that the Fed is paying attention to some of these things. Now, whether they will, uh, you know, whether that comes in play. I guess the Fed is not the BLS and, and they're different departments. What is, I think, the PCE is some. Private, the private organization. Yeah. I'm not even yeah. technically private. I mean, sort of part of the government. But. <laughs> they have offices close by or something. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, there's a whole lot on each and every one of these topics. Again, we're going through these really nice graphs that they have on all these. Um, but I thought that it was a nice uh, a nice summary of where the Fed is going. And, you know, Powell talked about this similarly uh, just like the other day. He, he addressed Congress. And, um, and it was interesting to see the breakdowns were a little bit half and half. Some people were like, ugh. They're not coming. The interest rate cuts are not coming. Or other people are like, no, actually, their interest rates are, are coming. Yeah. And so uh, I think that's, a, I guess, a sign of victory is if you're – you haven't shaken anyone one way or the other. Um, I was a little bit reassured only because I never really expected the six rate cuts that the market had priced in earlier this year. I think no. it was closer to three. I mean, those the, the six rate cut conversation was in the same conversation as there's it was going to be a recession in Q1 of 2024. Yeah. We got um, 
Um, yep. My calculations, Matt, we got three weeks left for that recession to start. Ooh, we're, coming, we're coming close. Well, and that's and this is an interesting thing, too, because it looks like the argument from the Federal Reserve is that, well, if we see interest rate cuts, it's going to because it's because we we did it. We won, we won. We landed the plane. Not because we caused a recession. Not a recession driven. You know, misery driven. Um, it's one where no uh, inflation went down, and so now we can now we can lower rates. Um, I really hope that that, that 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 comes to pass. I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of pain, but they never identified like a really pressing emergency in the economy. Um, maybe they'll cause one before you know before this election season, but. I didn't yeah. see any doom and gloom in this. I, I, I mean, I think there is a good argument, um, and I'll give you the counter that you know, where's the evidence that we're in like true restrictive territory? I mean, there's some you know prices are going down, they're normalizing, mm-hmm. but it doesn't really seem like. I mean, if you look at the stock market, you look at Bitcoin, you look at single family homes, yeah. it's like we're not super restrictive. So maybe you know we don't need to be in a hurry to start yeah. moderating rates, but also you know. If rates come go from you know five and a quarter where mm-hmm. they are right now to five, yeah. or four seven five to five, mm-hmm. you know that doesn't really change. I mean that's pretty immaterial of a of a change. Yeah. It's not much looser. Mm-hmm. It's totally psychological. And they could stick. I mean, yeah. if they think that they are, and it kind of goes to, sh- to show just how it. I mean, it's all psychology rather than. Mm-hmm even the kind of the, the nominal rates, you know, the Fed funds coming down a little bit isn't going to really help too many people. Yeah. I mean, it, it might a little bit, but I mean, if you're looking at like taking out a bridge loan, which like a SOFR would be based on or floating rate, you know, mortgage, mm-hmm. you're, the spread's still there. So, you know, maybe you're, you're in, instead of paying nine, you're paying eight and three quarters or yeah, eight yeah. and a half. But we have so much to go to come down from. That yeah. and this is I think we made this point in when we talked about loan maturities last year, is that uh, that historically the Fed doesn't doesn't cut rates that quickly where well, relief will be coming uh, in one single year. They they don't if outside there's not a reason yeah. to. Yeah, yeah. And usually <laughs> when they yeah. lower rates, it's because of a crisis. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think they were hoping not necessarily for a crisis, but for there would be overwhelming evidence that mm-hmm. okay, we need to bring rates down. And and it's also not binary. It doesn't go. It doesn't need to be either. We keep it. It's a super restrictive, or mm-hmm. it goes to zero um, or near zero. You know, it could be somewhere in the middle, um, but. I've also you, yeah go ahead. I've also read some interesting articles. I haven't included them in the newsletter about how potential um, d- like consumer sentiment, the negative drag, like, like this mystery bit of like mm-hmm. what do they call like the like the hidden recession? I, they had some kind of portmanteau about it. Whatever they feel bad because interest well, rates are high. It, yeah. it, some of it may be inflation, yeah, but some people are are mad because they can't get a good loan, and that may be why they're mad. And so, the, what can the Fed do about that? I don't, I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's just that's not. I don't think it's in their mandate. You know, but, but I, I do think you know. Again, there's 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 a lot of different factors. It's a, yeah. it's di- it's very dynamic, and the Fed's not looking at month over month or quarter over quarter. They're looking at long term trends. But I think that they found themselves uh, in a situation where they maybe have kind of. Um, jumped the gun a little bit mm-hmm. in back in uh, or end of 2023, kind of indicating that looking at yeah. lowering rates mm-hmm. and everyone got way too over exuberant yeah. and things started getting crazy. And so then a couple pieces of data were pointing the other direction and they've had to backpedal a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and they'll do a lot of backpedaling of saying, yeah. hey, look, no, like we rates may have to stay higher for a longer period of time. You know, we're making progress, kind yeah. of saying two things at once, mm-hmm. but really kind of they, I think there was a. There was a major attempt to throw some cold water on the whole idea that rents are coming down. Then we saw Treasury rates increase, um, but you know since then we're seeing kind of the positive data of the same data of kind of yeah. normal growth, um, declining growth, which is good for interest rates coming you know back up. Um, and you know we're now seeing that in interest rates, and that's you know mm-hmm. one thing I, I, I wanted to mention also is just taking a look at the ten-year Treasury real quick. I'm just going to pull it up. Um, because you know, we we have been all over the place. Yeah. Um, over oh, it's it's come down even more, Matt. Um, we it we have been all over the place over the last uh, six months. Um, and just want to highlight that real quick because again, it's it's every couple of weeks. We I've been saying this for the last year. Every three weeks, the the narrative changes. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, you know, it's three to five weeks, but whatever. 
Oh, if I can hold on to this. So, I mean, I'll go back to uh, one, a full one year chart. Um, you know, rates, hmm. you know, from last year around this time, this last year, you know, they were, they were, they were pretty attractive kind of in the low threes. We thought, you know, everything was pretty much kind of being done. And this yeah. is when people were saying, you know, at this point last year, people were saying, okay, they're going to, they're going to lower, Fed's going to lower rates by the end of 2023. That obviously didn't happen. Not only did that not happen, you know, the 10 year treasury, you know, all the, you know, peaked all the way here at basically 5%. It's going to mm -hmm. say 4.9998, you know, if that's not a tech, for technical reasons, I don't know what is. And then all of, so everyone's like, wow, okay, no, rates aren't going to be low and we're going to see much higher rates for a much longer period of time. It's always mm -hmm. going to be like this, no hope inside. This was like, this is the absence of hope right yep. here for a lot yep. of people. And then what happened after that? Well, everyone, you know, bought their bonds <laughs> and then prices fell right down here because we started getting really good economic data also. Mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of bottomed out at 3.7, you know, back um, at the end of last year, kind of December 27th-ish time frame. Uh, but then since all of a sudden, you know, when here where everyone's thinking this is this is during this period right mm -hmm. here this is when everyone's like six rate hikes six rate hikes we're gonna have all yeah. these rate hikes yeah and then all of a sudden it happened you know some stronger growth started showing up and then you know the tre you know, then you know the 10 year you know basically hit 4.3 but the fact that you know we have now retreated as new as additional data has come out which has mm -hmm. kind of confirmed all that this that's led down to this previous decline and what yeah. jerome palace said you know, we now have a couple of weeks of some declining rates. And again, for looking from a technical standpoint, I would have been concerned if, you know, we had gotten back to 5%, because then that could have meant we could really have, we could have blown out of 5%. Mm -hmm. If we had gotten yeah. out of 4.3, we easily could have gotten to 4.5. And if we'd gotten to 4.5, we could have, you know, kept going. But the fact that we kind of brushed 4.3, 4.3, 4.32, mm -hmm. and that we have come down pretty quickly um, now to 4.09 percent on the 10 year again it's going to change it's going to go back up it's going to go back down but so far we're seeing lower lows and, and lower highs mm -hmm. um which you know that that that's that's that that's a trend we need more data um but so far you know my gut is we're gonna there's gonna be a lot of volatility yep. there's gonna be a lot of swinging of emotions we're not gonna be able to effectively time this Mm -hmm. But I think we are moving down that track to normalization. Yeah, yeah. Softish landing. So it's going to be a touch and go. I think we're going to keep growing until, you know, Black Swan comes and yeah, changes yeah. everything. I mean, we were talking about how other countries have done and and, and the United States have, has done a little bit better in 2023 compared to other countries. Yeah. So had kind of a full-blown recession now. Yeah, there was, you're, there's been recessions in Europe. I mean, the ECB, um, Lagarde, you know, the... the um, the uh, chairman of the European um, Central Bank, mm -hmm. um, she came out and basically said that you know Europe's going to be seeing a lot of slow, slow growth, mm -hmm. slowing growth. Now, are indications that they are they may lower rates soon? They're, so, there are they Maybe. in slow growth and on the way up, or are they still? You know, is this what one of the things that I'm worried about is is you know a global downturn that that kind of loops in the United States, but. I'm hoping that um, um, they already kind of went through a lot of their down yeah. the downturn. I mean, they, they could they could see more, yeah. um, but uh, I don't know. I'm not following yeah. Europe yeah. As, as close as uh, I could. I, I think just the United States will continue to outperform yep. to a degree. Um, well, everyone keep track of all this. It's critically important. It's going to change in the next couple of weeks. Um, oh yeah, keep watching Gray Report because we're going to keep you up to date. You know, try to keep you three weeks ahead. At least three. At least three weeks. <laughs> um, again, if you're a credit investor and if you watch this whole video, you want to check out what we're doing on the multifamily side, how we're buying buildings. Okay, we actually have an opportunity open right now. Um, it's called River Club Apartments down in Evansville, Indiana. So if you're a credit investor, hop on over to greatcapitalllc.com. Book a meeting with the investment team. We'll get you all set up. Or you just go out on the portal right on the website. Um, sign up. Do your due diligence. We, we make it pretty easy. If you don't want to talk to us. Makes us sad, but no, it's all, it, I, I, I get it. You're, <laughs> you're, you're busy and you're like, okay, I, these guys are pretty straightforward. I can go back and, and see their opinions of the market for the last three years on a weekly basis. And you know, I go in their portal and like every piece of due diligence material I could ever wants there on the company and the firm and the deal. 
more transparent than I've ever seen. It's it's a great user experience, and they're a vertically integrated team with you know two billion dollars worth of transaction experience. Okay, I'm just I've seen enough. What's what's the um, conversation? I want to I want to announce uh, right now. I forgot okay. to announce that 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 Gray Capital has benefited from the leadership of one of CRE's best bosses, Spencer Gray, oh, got wow. awarded that, and I can now announce it. The embargo has been lifted, and um, I'm shouting it to the rooftop. So congratulations to Spencer. Thank, th- th- <laughs> we'll thank you, We'll put a link Matt. to that in the, in the show notes. Okay. Right. That, the pre- I appreciate that. Yeah, that was that was a big honor. Really cool. Really cool thing. Gray Capital's so, very own not, Spencer Gray. That's what I kept wanting to. Of course, well, yeah, bearing, bearing it to the end of the episode, I see. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Good, good, good. Yeah, no, no, that was that was a really. Uh, yeah. Don't know if I deserve it or not, but a really cool, oh, well, really well cool deserved. Save. Yeah, well, thanks, Matt. All right, well, um, make sure you subscribe. If you're not, catch you on the next one. Leave comments below. Tell us if we're off base or if you think we are somewhat intelligent. Not the case. All right, thanks again. See you next time.